Hey there, friends. You're listening to Chatology with Angie Elkins, and today we're having conversations that matter. Welcome back to another episode of Chatology. I'm Angie Elkins, your host, and I am thrilled you are here today. I am welcoming my friend Katie Orr to the show. She's been here many times before. If you've been a longtime listener, you know Katie, but this may be your first time to meet her. She is a author, speaker, pastor's wife, and she was the keynote speaker for the Enjoy God's Word online conference that you heard me promoting here on Chatology the last few weeks. And even though the conference has come to an end, live, you can still buy a ticket and watch all of it in replay. All of the teaching is downloaded for you to experience. So if you're interested, there's a link in the show notes for you to check out Enjoy God's Word. And stay tuned because Katie and I have a fantastic conversation over on Patreon. If you are a Patreon member, you will get to hear that. If you are not part of the Patreon group, I would love for you to consider joining It's a great way for you to show your support for Chatology for just a few dollars a month. You can say, I love this, I love what you're doing, and I want more of it. Also, we've got some really exciting stuff coming for patrons this holiday season, so you will want to check that out. There's a link in the show notes, as usual, for you to become a patron of Chatology. Okay, friends, here's my conversation with my friend, Katie Orr. Katie Orr, welcome back to Chatology. Hey, hey, Andy. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) I'm excited you're here too. You know, I already mentioned to you that this is, you know, one in a series of women who serve their local church, just focusing on them. And you were one of the first names on my list that I wanted to have on the show because you do this so well and you are a pastor's wife, but you also serve in capacity, like separate from being a pastor's wife, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's kind of hard to differentiate sometimes. Mm So um, you've been on the show before. So I'm going to link in the show notes to when Katie was on the first time to tell her story. So if you guys want to just, it, it feels like, (laughs) well, it was 2017. It was Was really, wow. Yeah, it was a (laughs) yawns. I know (laughs) it's bananas. But um, if you guys want to hear Katie's story, I'll link that one in the show notes so that you can go back and listen. But why don't you kind of catch us up on where you are now, Katie? Tell us a little bit about your life, what it looks like, all of that. Um, I am still a pastor's wife. I'm still a mom. Um, My kids now are, (laughs) this is big news for me. I have three kids that are in two schools this year. <laughs> Last year they were in three schools. Mm-hmm. So that was nuts because mm-hmm. three different schedules, all that. So I've got one in high school, two sure. in middle school. So that's big news for us. But kids that's are doing great. great. Um, church ministry has been great lately. And um, awesome. I think there was a big thing that happened between, I'm trying to think of the timing on everything, but probably was not long after I don't know. We've, we've had some ups and downs, but, um, yeah. Uh, church life is really great right now. The Lord is really, um, blessing. And, um, I graduated from seminary. So New Orleans Baptist yes, Theological did. Seminary have a BA in discipleship and I'm still getting, that was in May. I'm still getting used to the feeling that, I don't always have homework (laughs) hanging over me or a book to read. And so it's been fun to read for leisure and yeah, life is, we're just in a really sweet, sweet spot. It's busy. I think we all feel Mm. busy. I wasn't expecting, you know, when you have little, little kids, it's emotionally like just not emotionally, physically draining. And so that Mm. part is fine. Everybody, wipes themselves and feeds themselves and dresses themselves. And, you know, we're getting ready to have one driving in a couple of weeks, but it's yeah. just constant busy. You know, this one's got this practice mm-hmm. and that, and we try to say one thing, even with just one thing, we're all over the place. Yeah. So, but it's, yeah. it's fun. It's just fast paced, but I'm enjoying it for sure. So the driver, I'm sure people have told you this, but having another driver is going to change your life. I think so. You're going to love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, there's definitely some anxiety that goes with it, but having another person in the family who can drive places and pick things up and it's amazing. So 
That's going to change a lot. Counting down. We've got 15 more days. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. It's awesome. Um, yeah. So it's really good. It, when I'm listening to you talk about that, you know, I'm just a few steps ahead of you in the, in the life cy- parenting cycle. And um, it's so weird, Katie, because I just have one kid in high school and my other two are in college mm-hmm. now. So it's the weirdest thing. Like the first day of school was so anticlimactic. <laughs> it was, it was like, so, yeah. we just ran yeah. to Target the day before, <laughs> got a backpack. Uh-huh. I ordered him some new tennis shoes online. And that morning I was like, you want breakfast? And he was like, toast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just that's awesome. No big deal. Mm-hmm. It's just, but you I remember, I remember elementary school when you're like, you got to get the shoes and the socks mm-hmm. and the, all the school supply list. And the, I mean, it is such, it's like a two or three week production, just getting ready to start school. Mm-hmm. And, um, and now it's like a piece of cake. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. You just hold on. If you're a mom of a little kid of little kids, hold on because it gradually gets a little bit mm-hmm. easier and easier it's impossible to see when you are in the stage of little kids, but it, it does arrive. Yeah. The time arrives. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, we're here today to talk about just kind of your life serving the local church as a pastor's wife. I want to start there. Um, tell me a little bit about when you and Chris got married. Did he know he was going to be a pastor? No, he did not. When we started dating, I was already in full-time ministry as a campus minister with Campus Crusade Mm -hmm. for Christ. He's three years younger than me, and he was a student. This was all at UNF. I went to Auburn University, went to Jacksonville to finish up my degree. I had a year internship in the hospital, and while I was there, I uh, helped out with the crusade ministry there in Jacksonville, and then I came on staff. And so... We were friends throughout all of that, but by the time we were dating and then got engaged, I was already in full-time ministry, and he really had to go through his own call. Like, Lord, are you calling me individually to full-time ministry, or are you Mm -hmm. calling me to Katie? You know, like, they needed to be, it needed to not just be one call. It needs to be, you know, individual call to ministry, and then, of course, call to marriage, and, um, Mm -hmm the Lord bringing us both into a place of full-time ministry. So he did, you know, have to kind of go through that and make sure that he was truly called to ministry and not just, it's so hard when you're in those like puppy dog love stages, you know, like Mm -hmm, you you can't mm -hmm. in some ways feel like you can't (laughs) trust your heart. Um, I very much kind of went through my own things with that. Um, Just being in love, Mm -hmm. but wanting to make sure I'm being wise at the same time. So anyway, Mm -hmm. he did indeed feel called, to ministry. We were in together. We were in college ministry for five years. And then it became through that time, the Lord was really more and more burdening him, Chris, for the local church. And Mm. at that point, it was very much his call. (laughs) I think if I had stayed single, I could have been on staff with Campus Crusade for the rest of my life. I loved it. I still love it. It, it just, mm-hmm. I was built, at least at that stage in my life, built for that ministry. And I okay. could have discipled girls for the rest of my life and led Bible studies mm-hmm. and taught and just doing even just the on-campus stuff. We called it the search and hustle, mm-hmm. you know, showing up on the first week of school <laughs> and um, yeah. meeting people and getting their information and following up and all of that, doing evangelism. I, I just, I loved it all. Um, I'm very initiative, outgoing. So it was a great fit for me. It was not as great of a fit for him. Um, he has the same heart for college ministry, but not the same personality. And so it was much more draining on him, that constant, you know, um, initiating with students And so through that process, you know, the Lord at the same time showing him this may not be the best fit for me and showing him that, um, hey, maybe God has something different for me, um, me being Mm -hmm. him. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, the Lord really, really uh, in many several different ways, really pulled out a heart and a burden for the local church and health for the local church. And that is undoubtedly what he has built for. He's so good at it. He is an amazing teacher. 
and preacher. He is mm. um, so good with people and the messiness of it. Um, if I mm. joke around, not that I ever want to be, but if if I were the if me and my personality were the pastor, I, you know, I would run the church into the ground so many times <laughs> because I can't. <laughs> I I just am not built to deal with the junk. Um, I'm not yeah. near as patient as I need to be. Mm-hmm. I'm not near as um, understanding. He's able to really <laughs> see the best in people, even when they're showing yeah. him their worst and to believe mm-hmm. the best about them. So that's, that's, that's kind of how that, and, and at first I did not, I wasn't excited, but I was very, I very much grieved leaving crusade mm-hmm. very much. Yeah. And I also felt for a long time that I didn't have a place. Because Chris was hired mm. by the church. He had a position. Yeah. When we were both on staff at Campus Crusade, we both got a salary. We both were hired. We both yeah. were ministers. And suddenly I felt like I was just mom. And so that was yeah. an identity thing that I had to go through. Um, took several years. Mm. Um, I think that's a thing for pastor's wives. I think especially if we are in an established church in the South, there is sort of a... I don't know, an expectation or, or not an expectation, you know, mm-hmm. an expectation of nothing in a way. And it's, it's very hard, I think, for pastor's wives to find their place to serve because if you go to, if you move and you come to a new church, whatever it is that you do, you know, that you're good at where you've served before, there's probably somebody already doing mm-hmm. that in the new church. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's tricky Mm -hmm. because you don't want to step on any toes and you're the pastor's wife. So you don't want to take over what they're doing. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's normal to have a hard time finding your place Mm -hmm. as a pastor's wife. Tell me a little bit about how you've navigated that in the past. Mm -hmm. I think you've alluded to this, but it really depends on the church and the context Mm -hmm. and the Flavor is not the right word. The person at each church has its own personality. Yeah. It's own history. Kind of the culture. Yeah. And the culture, that's a better word for it. And so it has looked different at each church that we've been to. We've been one, two, three, f- at least four different churches that he's pastored mm-hmm. in. And, you know, some, especially that first one, it was just a weird situation too, because it's part-time interim and we were kind of like, are we going to keep a job here or not? You know, it was just yeah. a, it was an <laughs> uncertain time. I certainly had zero and <laughs> zero. I was also in the throes of motherhood with two little ones and pregnant with a third um, and depressed and didn't realize it and all of that. So I really did mm. very little. Um, I did end up leading Bible study on my own. Um, I think it's mm. so healthy for every church member. Well, let me say this. I think mm. every believer should be a church member um, mm-hmm. as the Lord leads. There's definitely going to be times when we're in between churches, but um, yeah. I believe every believer should be a church member Mm -hmm. um, and that every church member should be serving. Um, And I don't like using shoulds. um, So I don't use those shoulds lightly, but I think it's very clear in the Bible that that is God's best, not just for the church, but for us as well. Yeah. And so I think we as individual, everyone, one of us, whether or not we are a pastor's wife, we have got to figure out where does God want me right now in this particular church because pastors Mm. wives aren't the only ones that move around from church to church god calls us some of you may have been at the church that you grew up in but most of us probably not Mm -hmm. and so we've got to answer two questions one what has god built me to do what experiences Mm. has, has he given me in my own workplace that may feel secular um you might be really good at finances like the church needs you You may be really good at decorating. The church needs you. Whatever it is that you're really good at, you may just be good at having people in your home and making them feel loved. The church needs you. And so what has God Mm. built me to do? I've had to answer that question. Every every one of us does. And then secondly, what do I need to do right now in this particular context and church that I am in? Mm. And that question is different. Sometimes we all need to put on... Uh, like VBS, I think is a great, great example that I am not called to kids ministry, but <laughs> VBS is kind of one of those short term, all hands on deck 
type of thing that I think everybody can get involved with, with one way or the other, yeah. even from home praying or inviting a neighbor or bringing a child. Um, every one of us can be involved yeah. in something like that, but that is not what I need to be doing in and out each Sunday. Um, mm -hmm. I am built to teach. I am built to disciple. Um, we're all called a disciple, but in a, in a more formal way, um, mm -hmm. and to lead, I've learned that that is what God has asked me to do. Now I can also sing, but I don't mm -hmm. do that in our current church because it's not needed. The church before I did sing a lot because we didn't have a lot of musical talented and it was needed. So yeah. all that to say, <laughs> it's so different in each church. We got to yeah. know how, what has God built us to be and do in the local church? Mm -hmm. And then what do I need to do right now in this season of life and in this culture of this church? Yeah, that's so good. I want to go back for a second because you mentioned you were depressed when you uh, were right. Did you say while you were pregnant with your third or right after? Yeah, right after. When your pastor's wife is depressed, mm -hmm. you know, like what was that like for you? Mm -hmm. Did you feel pressure to keep going and acting like everything was okay? I mean, I think we all probably do to an extent, mm -hmm. but tell me about that. Um. It's kind of a blur, honestly. Um, I think not more. I, I think I just said it was after. It was actually before. It was, it was probably a good three or four years, and I still struggle with it. I still struggle with it. Mm -hmm. But it was probably three or four years where it, it just I didn't recognize it as such. I think because I'm such a high extrovert and a yeah. an achiever, so I can't go long mm -hmm. without doing stuff like. A hard time just yes. sitting. I have to put rest on my to-do list, you know? Um, yes. But I just didn't want to be around people. That was, that was mm -hmm. a big thing. And so showing up week after week was hard. Uh, when we moved to Kentucky, I, at that point then knew I struggled with it and I'd been on med medication and I was a little more, had my antenna up. And in Kentucky, it was more seasonal stuff. I mean, this is real science, right? <laughs> the seasonal affective yeah. disorder. Uh, by February, every year we lived there, it was just like, oh, I just had uh, so little motivation to do anything. Okay. So, yeah, it's hard. Um, but I don't think it's, on one hand, it, we, it is different. We are different. People expect different things from us. Um, but it depends mm -hmm. on the situation and the context. Earlier on, mm -hmm. I we were we had moved around so, so much at that time. I didn't feel known by anybody, so th I don't think people okay. really recognized that I was depressed because they didn't know Katie before. To yeah, know that Katie it. right yeah. now is different. You said you're called to teach. That's what you do. Tell me what that looks like for you in your local church right now. Still figuring that out. <laughs> Actually, my husband and yeah. I have uh, several conversations about that recently. Um, because of the size of our church, we've got about, uh, we have a high snowbird po population. So right now in the summer, we're lower numbers, like 150-ish. Uh -huh. And then sometimes in the winter, okay. we can get up close to 300. It's crazy, just the difference. Like, yeah. It almost feels like it's not a different church. But, you know, you just, there's people that are we here half the year. Yeah. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. but I do serve as the, the lay. So lay meaning I don't get paid. I don't have an official whatever mm -hmm. with the church besides just a, as a committee member, I am the women's ministry director. Um, so I do get to mm -hmm. do some teaching there. We have a quarterly event, which you got to teach at, uh, recently. Yes, that was fun. So usually fun. three, three times a year there. Um, I am just, this is, I, I don't, I don't think I told you this yet. Our youth pastor, um, who was bivocational, um, God has called him to plant a church. So we are now without a youth pastor. Oh, wow. And just the way oh, looking wow. at budget and timing and all that, we're going to kind of wait to do a full search. And so in the interim, mm -hmm. indefinitely, my husband is now the youth pastor as well as the, the <laughs> senior pastor. So which means, and the Lord, it's so neat to see how the Lord has done that. But the, the Lord has really called me to it as well. And I'm really excited. So mm, I will cool. be doing some teaching on Wednesday night with the youth. Um, and I will also cool. have a group of senior girls that I will be oh, leading and that. discipling. And so I'm really, really excited about this new season. Um, Cause there was often times mm. where I felt like Wednesday night and Sunday morning, I just didn't have anything to do. And 
Yes. It was a season where I didn't need to do a lot. I was already doing women's ministry. I do serve in the nursery once a month because that's one of those things where it's that high need. I need to do it. We don't have enough people. Yes. It's not my, yes. you know, it's not one of those things that I get a ton of energy from like some people do, but I'm doing it because it's such a need. But then yeah. for that Sunday school hour and Wednesday night, I felt like, oh, I just want to be teaching. I just feel like, ah, oh. and so yes. it's neat to see how the Lord, we didn't know this was coming with the youth. And so, mm -hmm. um, the Lord is just so good, I think, to move us where we need to be at the right moment. And mm -hmm. he has yeah. very much been that way. Isn't it funny? I think pastor's wives are all built completely differently. And I've probably told this story on here before, but I had a pastor's wife. Um, she was my pastor's wife in Texas, but she told me this story about a church she had served previously where when they arrived at the church, when they first hired her husband, they actually gave her a job description. And she said, wait a minute, mm -hmm. is this a volunteer position? And she, and they said, yeah, of course, this is volunteer. And she said, well, then let me, <laughs> Good for her. let me volunteer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So funny story, but it's some pastor's wives are like me and you in that, where am I going to serve? Yeah. I've got to have somewhere that's my place. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who don't feel that pull to be in their place mm -hmm. every week. But I loved what you said about where is the need. And I have a good friend who, I mean, she's definitely a server anyway, but she goes where there's a need, you know, and she, you know, right now she's serving in preschool and it's just, it's that kind of thing. It's like, be open yeah. to just it may not be your favorite thing or, and it may not be the thing you're best at, but if there's a need, just jump in, you know? Yeah. I did that with, um, student ministry for a few years because my daughter, I mean, honestly, it, it came out of a need for my own daughter who needed to feel connected in there. And so me and our good friend, Stacy Thacker, we started leading a life group in there but I loved it. I loved being in there with those girls, you know, um, and it was not something I ever saw myself doing, mm -hmm. but you just got to be open, yeah. you know. When I did a study of 1 Corinthians 13 for a Bible study that I did, and one mm -hmm. of the things that still sticks with me is this, the, the context of that passage, love is patient, love is kind, all of that. It's, it's smack dab in the middle of this question that Paul is answering that the Corinthians has asked him, like, which gift is best, Paul? That's essentially like they're they're bickering and they're trying they're trying to settle the score and Paul's gonna set you straight. Like that's the attitude that they've asked this. <laughs> and so he comes in and just levels them all and says, Love, guys, you're totally missing it. But through that study, the I, I, the idea here was spiritual, you know, I was looking at the function of spiritual gifts, and you look at the other passages too that we all have a gift. If you have the spirit of God within you, you have gifts that God has given you. Then you also have experiences and talents. Those are different things. But the reason why we have these gifts is they are a crutch for the local church because not one of us is perfect oh, and the church is not perfect and it is not complete because one, like when we get to heaven, we are not going to have spiritual gifts because they're not needed anymore. We will That's each be perfect yeah. and complete, lacking in nothing. So the thing that you are good at, your church needs. And if you're not using mm -hmm. that, even that, even if it's just the gift of, I'm going to help wherever. If you're not mm -hmm. doing what God has called you to do, the church is suffering, period. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. And yet yeah. the reality in every church I've been to is you've got 10 to 20% of the people doing the lion's share work. Yeah. I know so many women that they are serving in the nursery and they're serving with the women's ministry and they're serving with the youth and they're, I mean, they are doing triple doing quadruple everything. duty. And then you got yeah. a bunch of people showing up every Sunday morning and that's it. And some of that is, you yeah. know, they may not feel, maybe they're just new. Maybe you feel like you don't know how to get involved. Like I get that. That's, that's, maybe that's what you need to help the local church with. Maybe you need to help the pa pastor help deploy the people because he can't do it all. Yeah. He just can't do it all. So yeah. man, I could get, I get fired up with this. So <laughs> no, I totally, I totally agree. Well, and 
you know, people, I, I just had this conversation with somebody the other day, but one of the best ways to get plugged in to your local church is to start serving, Absolutely. you know, and I have made some of my best friends with the, the women that I'm serving with in my church, the ones that I'm teaching life group with, or the ones that I'm, I go to student camp with, or, um, serve in children's choir with whatever it is. It's those people you get used to seeing them on a regular basis, you know, about their lives and you become friends. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that is the best way to strengthen relationships Mm -hmm. too, is by just jumping in and serving together. It's so fun. Um, well, tell me, have you ever gotten any kind of criticism or opposition for, or, or any, any kind of hurdles that you may have faced because you are the pastor's wife and because you have this gift of teaching, is there ever any conflict? Have you had any stories like that in your churches? Not specifically with the teaching part. I mean, there are some okay. you know, weird situations with individuals that they're, I mean, they're just kind of extenuating, but not really any, any issues with the teaching. I think that first part of your question before you said with teaching, yes, the answer is yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> as far as if we encountered hurdles, if we encountered all of that, I think a lot of it comes down to, and this could extend to those that deal with the teaching part too, expectations. That is a thing that, I mean, I could give you hundreds of examples of things people have said to me or the way someone's treated me, um, good or bad, you know, that it comes mm-hmm. down to expectations, whether or not mm-hmm. we realize it. Every one of us has an expectation in our mind of what the pastor's wife should or should not do, should be like or should not be like, period. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the yeah. pastor and the pastor's kids. We just assume mm-hmm. that because they are in ministry, that they have their quiet time all the time and they don't yell at their kids and they um, <laughs> have God on speed dial, you know, and it, it's just not mm-hmm. true. Now, Hopefully it's the case that every pastor is spiritually mature and has been walking with God for a while. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps if you are a new believer, then it is right to look at your pastor and his wife as more mature than you. Hopefully that's the case. If you're a new believer and your pastor's in ministry, but they've been a new believer too. At some point they sin, they mess up. Uh, And so Mm -hmm. I think there is this expect this level of expectation And then when we mess up or say the wrong thing, which we will do, instead of it being kind of a little bit like, oh, I didn't think she was that way. Like we would do with anyone else because it's the pastor or the wife, you know, you've put them on a pedestal 10 feet up and now all of a sudden they're down to the ground. That's a bigger Mm -hmm. leap. That's a, you know, a bigger distance to fall versus just the everyday person at church. And they say a little something, snide comment and you go, oh. Okay. Well, they've only dropped half an inch, you know? So (laughs) (laughs) how do you process that? Early on, it was fine. Early on, it was just like, that's just, it comes with the territory. And I dealt with that a little bit with um, being on staff with crew. It's different, but I definitely felt that weight of responsibility of I'm a leader and Mm -hmm. um, we raised support. So we had a team of people giving us money every week or every, you know, every month to minister. So I very much felt that responsibility as we should Mm -hmm. anyone in ministry. It wasn't until recently that we started, you know, the last uh, several years or so where I think we've just become a little um, worn down and sometimes Mm -hmm. disillusioned, you know, like, what are we doing? Like, Mm -hmm. what are we doing? Is this doing anything? Are we going anywhere? Hello, God, like, does our, does, does, does what we do matter? And I think that, again, comes yeah. with the territory. Anybody doing uh, a hard work, whether or not you're in ministry, you know, after a while you just get tired. And then mm-hmm. encountering more and more church conflict. At that point, then, there has been something that has changed in me where I struggle with it more than I used to. Hmm. I think before, my, because my personality is, I don't care if you like me, I just want you to respect me. So I don't deal with this whole, oh, I don't want to say this because I don't want them to not like me. So I was a little more black and white with it where it was just like, you know what? If they don't like that I wore jeans to church, who cares? 
they'll get over it. That was more <laughs> my attitude, right or wrong. Now I mm-hmm. overthink it because of hurt, because I've been hurt, mm-hmm. because I've been wounded. Okay. And because now I'm like, well, what, what is she going to think? Is she going to talk to so-and-so? Da, 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 da. Because mm-hmm. there are, is that, I guess, on the very small scale, that post-traumatic stress. Yeah. The littlest right. thing a little now, PTSD. Yeah, can yeah. really, can really get to me. How do you find your role when in like being a support for Chris? Um, you know, we are a part of our job as a wife, no matter what your husband is, does for a living is to come alongside and just, you know, listen, be there for him. But I know a lot of ministry couples handle it differently. Some pastors don't bring it home as much because they don't want to put a burden Mm -hmm. on their wife while others use their wives as, you know, processing and therapy and sounding board and all of that. What's it like for you and Chris? For us, um, probably the, the biggest tensions that we've had, especially going from crusade ministry where we were equals in a lot. I mean, we were equals. We were both on staff. In fact, the last couple of years Mm -hmm. we were there, I had a position that was associate campus director and he was staff member, you know, So all that to say, we were, we just, we were both in the job. We were both, we all, we knew everything because I was in the meetings. Even when I had kids, I was in the meetings. And so I was in the know. And then suddenly he, it's his job. He's in the meetings. I'm on the outside. And that's been a struggle for me. Not that it's him. It's just my, my own part. Like Mm -hmm. I want to be in the know. I want to know everything. I want to be involved. I want to help. I want to brainstorm. I want to plan. I love all the planning meetings. He hates them. You know, so in some ways, leadership wise, (laughs) I have, I'm built for that type of thing. I'm not Mm -hmm. built to be a pastor as far as the pastoral care, but the leadership, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And I like to strategize. So that has been something that continues to come up from moment one even to just recently of me wanting to come in and give my two cents and sometimes he's just ready to come home and not talk or think about he's more i guess it's that male brain we've heard that before spaghetti Mm -hmm. versus filing cabinets you know very much a filing Mm -hmm. cabinet so he comes home and he wants to check out he is so loving and caring though like he knows that i want to be a part of it and so he will He will pull that file back out for me. I don't always do the best at paying attention to the timing of that and really looking at is, does he have the capacity to talk about this right now? I'm bursting at the seams Mm -hmm. wanting to talk about it. So that that's always been hard. It's, it doesn't, he's so patient and kind that it doesn't end up being a big deal. We don't get in fights over it mainly because of his personality, not mine. (laughs) <laughs> so that's just something that Same. we've had to learn to ha- make space for that and not it be at mm-hmm. 10 o'clock at night because I'm just, we haven't talked about it for so long and I just got to talk about it and I'm <laughs> bursting and he's tired and we're, I'm tired too at 10 PM, but it's like, we got to <laughs> talk about it. That's always been a struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think every, every couple for sure is different, but um, mm-hmm. you know, there are some men as far as supporting him. I feel like he supports me more than I support him. He does all the cooking, <laughs> especially when I was going through seminary, he took on so much. He, he mm. drove kids to places. He did all the cooking. Everybody yeah. does their own laundry. That's been the case since they were mm-hmm. five, you yeah. know? So I am not the wife that cooks and cleans and keeps the house. <laughs> it just, it's just not who I am. And I, I have yeah. my things that I do. I do find it, you know, we each have our roles. They may just not be yeah. the traditional things. But one thing that mm-hmm. has been fruitful is continually talking about it. What do you need from yeah. me? And he's mm-hmm. clear. I, I know exactly what he needs from me. He does not need mm-hmm. a clean house to come home to. Would he like it? Yeah. But that's not something he needs. <laughs> Some men need that. They need that. They need to come home to a serene space. And I have learned that that is not what he needs. So it's not where I need to pour my energy into. That's marriage 101, whether or not we're Mm -hmm. pastor and wife. (laughs) Absolutely. That's right. I mean, it's the same for all couples. Um, How do we be what the other person needs, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's so great. I love that he's been cooking. Um, Robert 
started cooking too. As I've kind of grown my business um, and I've been working so much, he has, we started ordering HelloFresh. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've done that. Mm -hmm. I, this is not sponsored. <laughs> I wish it was. HelloFresh, if you want to sponsor me, please. Um, but hey, we started getting HelloFresh and the reason we did it is because a friend of mine said that it gave her husband confidence that he could make dinner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm in. <laughs> And he's always said he'd wanted to cook, uh -huh. wanted to learn uh -huh. to cook. Let me tell you, girl, he can make those HelloFresh nice. meals. It, they, and yes, and they're good. Mm -hmm. So awesome. that's been pretty good. We, yeah, it's been pretty awesome to have somebody else who can do dinner and you don't, you know, so I love that. Um, okay. One last question. And then I want us to jump over to the Patreon group because um, I've got a good question for you Patreon on Patreon, party. but here's my last question. <laughs> I know, right? Here's my last question for this interview. What do you think is the biggest issue facing ministry couples in the local church? So couples like me and you or, and, and our husbands or couples like that are brand new entering ministry. What do you think is the biggest challenge? I think communication and serving one another. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy yeah. to, it, it's really not that much different than any other marriage, but because we are under scrutiny, because mm -hmm. the evil one would love to take us down because if he can take us down, he can take the whole church down. Uh, he yeah. can, I mean, how many people are de-churched, like the given up on church because their youth pastor ended up sleeping with a kid or something, you know, like right. how much right. that has happened. So the evil one would love to take us down. And so in that sense, um, we've got targets on our back, both by the everyday person looking at us and then also the evil one. So I think it just compounds the normal things that every couple mm. deals with. And so communicating and not serving one another selfishness. I and mean, that's the, mm. that's the biggest, yeah. biggest thing. And if we're not walking with the Lord, I think it's so, it gets so busy um, teaching and serving and showing up. And yet mm. we let our time with God our conversations with him or intimacy with him. Yeah. Uh, slip and so the longer we get into ministry well maybe that might, may not be true I think sometimes we walk into ministry as in our 20s thinking I got this I'll figure it out I don't need God you know we <laughs> wouldn't say that but we think we got it all figured out um, and yeah. then when you get older then you start feeling like oh I got this down you know we're in a rhythm I can I can mm -hmm. do this on my own and so that lack of dependence mm -hmm. and so that's a recipe for disaster if we're not depending on yeah. God not in his word and we're selfish and we're not communicating that yeah, I think that's so good. So true. Um, and really, again, like you said, Marriage 101, it's just uh, you can get so busy. And I think there's such a high value put on us serving the church that we can, t we can easily make that a priority. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just so easy to do because it's valued and praised. Yes. You know, um, but when you're really taking the time to pull back and focus on marriage, your marriage and your communication and your family. Um, people don't see that. And so there can be some criticism that you're not as present or you're not around or whatever. But like, I think forging through no matter what and per pursuing that, putting that first is always, always the best way to go. So. And this, this is kind of silly, but you know, we don't like to talk about that. That includes sex ladies. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. I think that that's that part that's of that silly. communication piece that yeah. we, that's that a lot of selfishness, especially on women's part often is I'm tired and whatever. And so do what you got to do, right. schedule it if you need to. That was one of the best yeah. things we ever did is we just started scheduling mm -hmm. because yes. of our, our dispositions. And I, mm -hmm. I just couldn't take it as love when it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm tired and I've been breastfeeding all day or whatever, you know, right, but if right, I know, right. because I've checked out for the day, but if I know it's coming up. I can be prepared for it mentally, physically, yeah. spiritually. So that's part of that communication. It's not just the verbal <laughs> and it's so, yeah. so, so important. God has given it to us as such an amazing, good gift and we need to absolutely. Need to make that. 
Well, and I mean, you can tell when there's been a gap there. You can absolutely tell in in just your closeness, Mm -hmm. day to day closeness Mm -hmm. with your husband, you know. And so it is it is so important, important and essential beyond what we can see. Yes. Like it's just so much bigger than what we can see or what we know Mm -hmm. is actually happening. Um, It's a supernatural connection. It really Mm -hmm. is. And so so I'm glad you brought that up because that's very important. Maybe we should have saved that good stuff for the Patreon group. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Thank you, Katie, for being here. Let's jump over to Patreon. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I love Katie Orr. She is one of my favorite people. I love talking ministry with her. And I would love for you to check out all of the things that she does ministry-wise online that's available to you. Bible Study Hub is an amazing ministry. She has some fantastic books that we will link in the show notes. So check her out. And then I want to remind you to check out our Patreon page and become a member so you can get all the fun things that are coming for the patrons, but also the rest of this conversation with Katie. Okay, that's it, friends. Chatology has been a production of Angie Elkins Media. Show notes and production help from Jill Pierce. Music by the maestro himself, Robert Elkins. Thank you guys for listening. And remember, share Chatology with your friends and family and start a conversation that matters.